Well, good morning and welcome to our Sunday teaching. Uh, today we're going to continue our look into the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, we're starting chapter 8 today. Chapter 7 ends, uh, which we looked at previously, um, ends with this kind of dire point of view of the state of humanity, of the available, availability of wisdom among men. Um, you know, it says that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes, which yes, we have, but Solomon kind of paints this depressed point of view of, you know, I looked around and there's, there's none who are wise. I looked at a thousand men and one are wise. I looked at a thousand women, most likely talking about his wives and, uh, and there was no wise. And so he, chapter eight is kind of him giving, giving himself his head a shake and say, no, 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 it, Wisdom is attainable. There are those who are wise, and we can have this point of view. We, we can be wise. So it's encouraging in a way, um, and it's, it's good. So let's take a look at it. We're looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 8, uh, verses 1 through 9. It reads, Who is like the wise, and who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine, and the hardness of his face is changed. I say, keep the king's command because of God's oath to him. Be not hasty to go from his presence. Do not take your stand in an evil cause, for he does whatever he pleases. For the word of the king is supreme. And who may say to him, what are you doing? Whoever keeps a command will know no evil thing. And the wise heart will know the proper time and the just way. For there is a time and a way for everything, although man's trouble lies heavy on him, for he does not know what is to be, for who can tell him how it will be? No man has power to retain the spirit or power over the day of death. There is no discharge from war, nor will the wickedness deliver those who are giving to it. All this I observed while applying my heart to all that is done under the sun when man has power over his hurt. So that is our text for today. Um, and as I said, he kind of has a, a wake-up call in this or, or a sobering point of view where he, <clears throat> he goes away from the dark wandering of his mind and says, No, no, no. Wisdom is a thing. You, you can have wisdom. Um, a side note would be having wisdom and using it. And Solomon's a fantastic example of that, where he had such wisdom, but he failed so badly. Um, and so use the wisdom that you have and choose to do what is right. When we stumble into negative thinking, as, as another kind of side point before we get into the meat of what we're looking at today, but when we stumble into this negative thinking, and, and part of it can be that of, looking at the world and being like, everyone's a fool, there's no wisdom, and, or I have no wisdom, I'm a fool, and, and I respond poorly to everything that happens and, and whatnot. We can paint these miserable, depressing pictures sometimes. Um, I'm reminded of Pastor Tim and, and two of his questions that he often puts out there when he, he teaches about you know, mental health and anxiety and dealing with that and stuff, and the two questions being, is it true? And is it important? Because so often we can have a, a point of view in this inner dialogue in our, in our minds. And if we just pause for a moment and be like, is this true? Oftentimes we'll be like, no, I'm just being silly. I'm moping around and it's not reality. And so move on from that. Is it important? Well, maybe it's true, but it's not actually important. It doesn't have a big effect. So who cares? And so Solomon kind of has this negative point of view and then he comes out of it and, you know is that true no not really that's not true we can have wisdom and it does have a good effect and and we can pursue that and god is with us so there's that he goes on to make some other points that are, that are really well and we're going to focus on those he highlights the blessing of wisdom he he makes this statement that when a man is wise his face shines that his hard heart or his hard face goes away and he's made glad. And that's a wonderful point because when we truly have wisdom, we, we don't stress as much. When we have wisdom, the anxiety goes away. When we have wisdom, we recognize certain things that 
bring about joy. And so it's not a contradiction to what was previously said. No, it's a different point of view. And as we've said, Ecclesiastes is written that way, where it gives multiple point of views to show the downfall of those ways of thinking. It's in wisdom that we see the foolishness of man, yes. And it's in wisdom that we, we look around the world and we start to see how dark and how dire it actually is and how what a horrible situation it is. And that can, yes, it can lead to a depressing view of the world, but wisdom, when we take it a step further, good wisdom also leads to this. God is in control. God will judge. And while everything looks bad, God will work it out for good. And so when I, I cannot say, you know, why, why be depressed about it? Like, why should we be depressed about it? In wisdom, we know God and we will be glad. And although the day might seem odd to us, we can trust him and know that that is good. Previously, uh, in some of the teaching, I've talked about this idea that's called the best of all possible worlds. And I think that fits well here as well. Um, the best of all possible worlds is this idea um, tied in with Molinism that, that God knows everything that you would do in any possible situation. And so in God's character, he would have made the world um, where the most amount of people repent and turn to follow him. He would have made the world in which the most amount of good by his standard of good, not the world's, but by the most amount of good would happen. And so while we can look at the world and we can say, this is dark and this is evil and this is horrible, God can look at the world and say to us, yes, but this is as good as it possibly would have been while still giving people the choice of free will. So that's a, that's a, a little philosophy doctrine that, that I hold. Um, and I think it matches with God's character and we can see that God is in control, and even though the echoes of people's sin and, and people harming each other and, and the evilness of the land is out there, God is still in control. And it's, it's kind of that idea, right? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, though I walk through this scary and evil place, I will fear no evil, for God is with me. His rod and his staff comfort me. Right? Although the day is dark... I am with him who is literally light. Then Solomon goes on to make this point about the king. And, and we kind of struggle with this at times because here in Canada, we don't have a king. Now you could say, oh, well, we're whatever that's called, a colony or, or whatever the term is of England. And so, oh, we have a king. It doesn't affect my living at all. Hardly think of the guy. Um, However, I have been in places where there is a king. I spent some time in Thailand when I was in college, and I know I've mentioned that before. But in Thailand, they have a king. And so if you, um, if you go to the movies before the movie shows, they would play this video, and you had to stand at attention silently as this movie highlighting uh, all the great things that the king had done and the king's song plays. Um, and if you didn't stand, you're kicked out. If you talk during the song, you're kicked out. If you moved around, you're kicked out. Like you had to show respect or there was repercussions. I can remember one time I was running in a park in Bangkok and I had headphones in and it was kind of eerie because at the exact same moment, everyone stopped and it's a, you know, that's a huge city and everything's moving around and all of a sudden everything stops. And then I take the headphones out and I hear the king song. So, so I stop because I'm in a land where the king is there. And so I'm going to honor the king of that land. And also because I don't want to you know, get arrested and whatnot. But you had to stop at attention and honor the king. And they would why, you know, this little greeting that they would do. And they had this other one that was like drawn out and really expressive and reserved for the king. We don't get that here. We don't really understand it as much. But it says, keep the king's command because of God's oath to him. Be not hasty to go from his presence. Do not take your stand in an evil cause. For he does whatever he pleases. Um, for the word of the king is supreme. Who may say to him, what are you doing? Uh, a king is, is very different than the system of government that we have here in Canada. And when we look around at the world and we look at the different systems of government that are in place, whether it's a royal leadership, 
or whether it's democracy or socialism or communism or theocracy or, or whatever, and they all seem very different, they actually all have something in common. And that thing in common, and people love to debate, you know, oh, this system is better than this one and, and whatnot, but they all boil down to this. In Romans 13, 1, it says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. That's quite the, quite the text. Something to think. And many people don't like this idea. They push back against this, and they say, oh, you know, the country that I'm in is falling apart because of leadership. Our economy is crashing and crimes up and all this stuff about whatever government they find themselves in. And, and they say, how could God pick this person? He's doing everything wrong. Or, or they look at a, a foreign country. They'll look at North Korea and they'll see the great hardship of the people that the people face there because of this dictatorship government that has oppressed them for generations. The church in North Korea happens to be booming. But they'll say, surely God didn't choose that. But he did. He did. And we can see throughout history times where nations that were loyal to God, that were founded on Christian principles, then abandoned the ways of God, and God allows poor government to come into place for that nation to crumble, for that nation to feel what it is to abandon the ways of God when they've made a commitment to Him. And we can even look in into the Old Testament and we can see how God allowed the Babylonian and, and other empires to rise up that they might punish the the Israel Israelites in order to bring about a lesson from God. And so God is in control. He does. Every nation, every authority and government has been put in place by him and he has his reasons for doing it. We might not understand it, but that doesn't mean he doesn't have his reason for doing it. And our text in Ecclesiastes says the word of the king is supreme. And so who may say to him what are you doing? And it's this idea of like, you know, not actually seeking out knowledge, but kind of, you know, what are you doing? What are you thinking? Like, you shouldn't be doing it this way. You should be doing it this other way. It's practical advice as well, because if you ever find yourself in front of a king, some nation, and you, you question him in that way of judgment and demeaning, and you shouldn't be doing it this way, that could cost you your life. So tread carefully. Um, but Solomon here is using a teaching method that actually is it's, it's great because he makes one point that's easy to understand. And then through that point, he brings out a bigger point. Um, and we can see that here. So throughout the Bible, God has a number of names. And this is something else that the progressives will take and say, oh, this, you know, this means that uh, there's multiple gods or this is contradicting because you call them this here and this here. No, not at all. I'm Chris, and I'm also Christopher. <laughs> and in Thailand, I was a John Kiss. They, they struggled with the Chris sometimes, and, and so they called me that. Um, I'm Pastor Chris to some people. I'm the guy down the road to others, and I'm father or, or dad. I'm Reverend, Reverend Lowe, and in high school, I was Curly. And, and you can see, we have these different names, nicknames, and other things, we're talking about the same person. And when we look at the names of God, we have a, a variety of them. To mention a few, we have Yahweh, we have Lord, Adonai, Ancient of Days, the Great I Am, Beginning and End, Prince of Peace, Elohim, Wonderful Counselor, Good Shepherd, El Shaddai, and yes, King of Kings. And so Solomon makes this point, who are you to question the king? If he is your king, be loyal to him and understand that it is not your place to question him. It is your place to say, yes, as you say, your will be done. I submit to you. You are my king. I am your servant. I will do as you wish. And how much more with the king of kings? And from that comes this Christian view. If you are the king of kings... So who am I to question you? When we look into the story of Job in the Old Testament, we see this, where Job had a great hardship fall upon him, and God had his reason for it, very good reason for it. Um, and, and we get to see that in the book. But even outside of us seeing the reason behind it, Job wants to question God, and this booming voice finally comes, and God responds to Job and basically 
puts him in his place. You know, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Was it you who told the sea you shall come this far and no further? Was it by your word that the sun rises and goes down? Have you named the stars and put them in their place? And he goes through this, this quite actually a long stint of questioning Job based on the authority and power of God and belittling Job. and Well, not belittling, but showing Job his proper place. Belittling, I think, would mean making him feel less than he actually is, but, but humbling Job and showing him that he is man and God is God. And Job's response at the end, he's, he's practically in the fetal position, and he, he makes this statement to God, I heard of you, but I did not know. Now I know. I spoke once, but I will not speak again, for you are great and I am small. Know your place. It makes sense to wonder. And it makes sense to want to ask questions. And at times that's okay because to ask questions wanting to learn and to grow and to understand, oh, you know, God, why, why do you say that um, that a, a pastor, there we go. Um, now, this is just an example. Uh, but if you look into the Bible, there's times where people had multiple wives. And, and, but he says that the pastor, the overseer is to be a man of, of one wife. Well, why? And, and we might ask that question. Or, you know, God, you say that this is wrong. Why? And, and it, because we're wanting to know and we're wanting to grow more. Um, he does not owe us an explanation. But it's okay for us to pursue knowledge. And there's a difference between asking God a question and questioning God. One is a pursuit of knowledge and the other is a judgment and a misplacement of authority to think that we can actually question God. To come to God and say, you know, what are you doing? Why are you doing it this way? You shouldn't do that. You should do this. He does not owe you an explanation. He doesn't owe you an explanation. Now, in the worldly scene, when we look at governments and kings and stuff like that, this can be difficult when the leader is foolish or evil. But the beautiful thing about God is that God is good. God is just. He is perfect. He is trustworthy. And He is in control. And so we can trust His leading. And we can respond and say, I may not understand. I might have done this differently. But I know that you are greater than I, you are God and I am man. You know better. I see but a moment and you see everything. And so I will trust you and, and do what you want, not what I want. There's that. Now, this is somewhat difficult for people to do, it seems, at times, where they'll, they'll come to God and they'll say, you are my king, you are my Lord, I give my life to you. And then one of the things that the, the Bible calls for Christians to do is to be baptized in water, right? It's not required for salvation, no. But we are told to do it, and it is important. And so they'll, they'll be like, you are Lord of my life. I give my life to you. And then, you know, I come to them and say, okay, well, the Bible says that we should be baptized. So you should be baptized. And they're like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. I'm scared of water, so I don't want to do that. Or, or for whatever reason, I don't want to do that. And it's just like, but you, you said he was Lord of your life. And he says he wants you to do this. Or they'll, they'll, or, you know, they're in a relationship where they're living together um, with their boyfriend or their girlfriend or they're sleeping together and stuff like that. And, and people, and they come to God and they're like, I repent of my sin. My life is yours. Um, and then you're like, okay, then you need to stop doing this. You're like, no, I'm going to keep doing it. And how is that submission? That's, that's disloyalty. That's not proper. In Christianity, there's no part-time submission. Yes, we wrestle with sin and we stumble. There's a difference between that and just saying, no, I'm going to do what I want to do. That's living in sin. What does it mean to you if you say you are Lord of my life? if then you go and don't do what he's asked of you to do. There's no part-time submission. The text continues, it says, For there is a time and a way for everything, although man's trouble lies heavy on him, for he does not know what it is to be. He 
does not know what is to be, for who can tell him how it will be? No man has power to retain the spirit or power over the day of death. There is no discharge from war, nor will wickedness deliver those who are giving to it. All this I observed while applying my heart to, to all that is done under the sun when man had power over his hurt. You are not in control. You're not in control. And when you try to be in control, you try to defy what God has set in place. And it lies heavy on you. It creates anxiety. It creates problems. It creates unhealth. But when we can, in wisdom, submit to God and trust his plan, it brings about peace. It brings about a calm and a joy that goes beyond understanding and health. And this means even when we don't understand it. When God says, you're not to do this, and we say, well, I don't understand why, but okay, I will trust you. You can look at the Israelites and the fact that they had these dietary restrictions, and I'm sure at some point, you know, they're in Egypt, and someone's cooking bacon, and they're like, that smells phenomenal. God, why can't we have pork? I want to have pork. I don't understand why. And then we can look at it today and say, well, you know, pork eat everything, and they can carry you know, things like trigonosis, which is absolutely horrible. And if you don't cook pork properly, if it's not handled properly, you can get very sick from it. And so to some degree, we can say it's of good health that God allowed you or told you, don't touch this, don't eat it. There might be more of a reason than that. But even if we don't know the reason, we can say God is good. God is in control. God doesn't just make rules for the sake of rules. He has a purpose for what he's doing. And who am I to question him? He is the potter, I am but clay. If I'm out with my children and I say, hey, I don't want you going over there. And they're like, well, well, why? I want to go over there. And I don't need to explain to them that there could be ticks in that bush or that, you know, I saw a needle on the ground and I don't want them out of my sight or that, um, you know, whatever. There could be a multitude of reasons why I don't want them. I don't owe them an explanation. Now, there's times where I might choose to explain, to teach a lesson, and to help them to grow in knowledge. But there's other times where it's like, because I said so. Because I'm your father, and you're going to listen to what I say. And God is perfect, and God is good. And so it should be easier for us to trust him. And the truth is, is that there is a great peace that can be found in accepting the uncertainty of the future. The text makes that statement. You're not in control. You're not in control over tomorrow. You don't get to choose the day that you die. You don't get to be discharged from war. You don't get all these things. You are not in control. And when you can grasp that and hold that and find comfort in that, then you can say, regardless of what happens, regardless of the uncertainty of the future and of today, I know God is in control and I can find peace in that. For those of you who, who know me personally, you you can think about the, the year that I've had. And this last year has been the most surprising year for many reasons that are painful and, and were scary at times. But throughout it all, I'm able to say, God is good and God is in control. And while I didn't see this coming, and while it hurts and it's devastating, you are in control. The words of Jesus, he says, And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? You're not in control, so why stress over it? But you can hold the hand of him who is in control, and you can trust him. Accept your lack of control and trust God. See that he is the king of kings and respond appropriately. To be loyal, truly loyal to God, is a beautiful, beautiful thing. That's our text for today. Regardless of what you face, you can know God is good, He is in control, and He is with you. Like the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, looking at the furnace, whether God saves us, which He can, or He chooses not to, He is good, He is in control, and we will not turn away from Him. It's perfect, it's great. God is good. Dear Lord, I thank you for my brothers and sisters. I pray that you would be with us. Help us to honor you in all that we do. Help us to trust you when it doesn't make sense. We know that you are good. Amen. Have a great week. 
Honor God in all that you do.